Hey, this is Man Made Mead. Welcome to episode 7 of What's New with Mead. Today, we're going to be um, talking kind of about quarantine mead making and uh, what that's meant for me. I kind of want to give you some updates on things that I'm working on. And then, of course, uh, um, I want to share with you guys things like what are some mistakes I've made recently and um, those various things. But I'm excited to have you uh, along for this ride. And if you're listening to this uh, on podcast land, you might be listening on Spotify or an Apple podcast, which I urge you and hope you will go and rate on those things that will help the show and lets me know how I'm doing. Um, if you're listening, of course, on YouTube, you're probably, watch- probably watching the video version, um, which is, again, available on YouTube. And uh, you can leave your comments there. And, of course, hit like and subscribe to support the channel. But... To uh, get started with episode 7, I always talk about what I'm drinking. Right now, it is only um, about 1.45 in the afternoon on a Wednesday. Um, you know, quarantine life, days are kind of blending together now at this point, but uh, I didn't really want something very heavy right now, and um, I wanted something light. So I have a, this is a, a Lagunitas uh, India Pale Ale. So I'm just sipping on that, just something to moisten the palate a little bit, but um, I think if you've ever had it before, it's pretty good. It's a standard pale, Indian, uh, standard IPA in the world. But I'll be drinking this tonight, or this afternoon. So, very, very hoppy. But uh, that takes me to our, our part two, which I want to discuss some things I've been working on in this time. I have, if you um, are a fan of the channel, if you are a subscriber to the channel, um, you've noticed I've been trying to put out a couple more videos a week. That's kind of the goal between the podcast. Uh, I'm trying to do tastings on Fridays if I can. Um, and then Monday and Thursday, I always put out content. And generally, I'm trying to make them into these um, uh, experiments and various things like that. Now, the complex thing I'm running into, the issue, is that some of these experiments are... Um, taking a long time. Some of them take like, you know, two, like a bare, at, at least two weeks. And at max, I've had a couple take four months. In fact, I have um, some videos that I'm putting together actively that are taking, or at the end of it, going to take, I think, five months to have done. So obviously, I can't put out one of those every Monday and Thursday because timing. So um, I've been working on some of those things. I've got quite a few videos in the vault. Um, like that that I'm working on just to let you guys know. But the big one that I put out recently the other day was this big yeast test that I did. It was an ultimate yeast test where basically I experimented with um, a bunch of Red Star yeasts, a bunch of Lalvin yeast, and bread yeast. I used the same recipe across the board and then I um, put those yeast into each one, each of these eight mason jars, let that ferment out to see the results of how did it taste? Like, what did the meads? What was the difference between the yeasts and the meads that we had there? So, I, um, if you want to know everything about that video, go watch it. Of course, that's probably the easiest way to do this. But what I would say is, um, there is a massive difference between uh, flavor profiles that yeast give off, and I knew that before. But this test really opened my eyes and um, helped me see some things. So um, if you want to check that video out, of course, to give you the gist of what happened, the, uh, this is general, generally speaking, the Lalvin products tended to ferment faster and they cleared up very quickly because they had fermented faster. The Red Star products, products moved really slow and they didn't ferment as fast um, and they're still hazy. They took a while because they had just finished fermenting. Um, some of them ended drier than the others, and that was interesting to me. Part of that plays into the alcohol content that the yeast could support, and um, I used, again, the same mead recipe throughout the entire thing. So some of them chewed through all the gravity, some of them did not, and that's okay. It just meant that we had some various different things. The real topic I want to hint at is within that video, I had some people who were saying who gave, gave some comments saying, um, you know, things like your uh, temperature at which you ferment changes things a lot, which it does. And that's one thing that I addressed in the video early on. I said, this is going to, they're all fermenting at the same temperature. 
because I don't have a way, honestly, to do eight different fermentation temperatures at the same time. Uh, that would be pretty crazy, in my opinion. And as someone just like me, that's a lot of control. So what I did is I let them ferment at about uh, 70 degrees, and um, then they all, they all did fine. Now, here's the thing. Are there different flavor profiles that can come from different yeast at different temperatures? Absolutely. And that's why on the packet of a yeast, or if you look it up on Google, you'll find the optimal fermentation temperature range of a mead, or of a yeast, I should say. So if it says to sit between 45 and 65, then of course, your best temperature range is probably going to be somewhere in that middle. Um, not necessarily on the extremes of the low, like 45 or, or 65. So yes, I could have had some varied results from that. However, I did not want to dive into that because I knew that it would be such another, uh, it'd be, a, it's a whole nother test in itself and it would be really hard to control that. So that was one thing that people were saying. They wondered, okay, well, what if you had fixed the temperature to be, you know, optimal for each yeast? I think there could have been different results. Yes. The other thing I heard was some people were saying that the nutrient addition that I, I added in the middle of it, um, the same amount of nutrients throughout it all, and they said, you know, different yeast require different amounts of nutrients. Again, this is a very true fact. However, to keep it as fair as possible, I didn't want to give some of them nutrient and some of them not, like, no nutrient at all because I just don't think that's fair. So I gave them all nutrient. There are some things about that test that were not completely... Uh, suited for every single yeast. Yes, yes, some of the yeast did not need um, to have those nutrients added. That's fine. Some of them needed to be in a, a 60 degree fermentation chamber to be their best. However, again, I don't want to do that. That was one big test. If you want to go check it out, of course, go check it out on the channel. Uh, it's Man Made Mead on YouTube. But th that's one thing that I finished recently, and I was that has set off a whole nother world of things for me to start doing. And I have a bunch of ideas for um, mead mythbusters, as I'm calling them. So when you think of something in mead making, a lot of times we um, we hear these industry standard things, and I am trying to test some specific um, tests like that. And in the past, I've done it. I just haven't labeled it as. Mead Mythbusters. So, for example, one I did previously, um, it's not called Mead Mythbusters, but it's primary versus secondary fruit addition. I've done this with pineapples before, and that is such a interesting concept because there are so many different flavor profiles that come from putting a fruit in the primary and then also from putting it in the secondary. So I think it's important that we know the benefits of both. And, and to give you a brief overview of that, what I noted with at least pineapple is that in the primary, the pineapple um, actually had more of a, had a, not as sweet of a finish. When I think of a pineapple, I taste something that is, of course, sweet on the front, and then it has this very peculiar, very distinct fruit taste. And it's hard to explain exactly. I think of... Um, it's very tropical, of course. It's, that's not a that shouldn't even have to be said. But it uh, what's the best way to explain this? It's hard to explain some of these flavors. Like how do you pronounce? How do you say what a pineapple tastes like without saying it tastes like pineapple? Well, I'll put it this way: in the primary, you got more of the sweet side of. Um, I'm sorry, did I say that backwards? No, that's right. Okay, so the primary was the sweet uh, side of the pineapple flavor. And then in the secondary, I got the opposite. And I had more of the character taste of the pineapple in the beginning and then less of it later on, which was interesting to me. So that's not standard for every fruit, though. I could do a test on every single one, do it for peaches, pineapple, or uh, peaches, mangoes, apples, you know, you name it, strawberries. I could try that with all those things and get varied results. However, that is not the only thing that affects a flavor of a fruit, and that uh, the other side of it is your yeast. So I'm doing lots of tests like that, which require um, kind of months of effort and, and trying things, and so I'm trying to put out content in that regard. And I have a few things cooking in, in the vault. I won't give you, I won't spoil it here because they're not going to come out yet. 
but uh, I'm excited to share those with you in the future. If you have any ideas for Mead Mythbuster idea or uh, you know questions, if you have a question about mead making that you want answered, ask me, and I'll see if I can put together a test. Now, some of these tests have to be realistic. Um, I'm trying to do things that um, I can, you know, that are that are, are clear. It's hard for me to do these tests that are like six to a year six months to a year long because it just takes so long to do the video and then I'm stuck with a, a carboy um, where I'm sitting on it for whatever just a long time so I've been doing those things in my quarantine time and um, it's been a really good time for me to work on videos and do these things uh, of course I have a bunch of uh, other meads that I've been making I make some of these meads off camera I make some of them on camera it just depends on what I'm doing and um, you know, I just finished today a beer. I just finished a, it's really a blueberry braggot, but it's a, the base of it was a blueberry honey ale um, that I made. And then the recipe that I used called for two pounds of honey. Well, I doubled that and I got four and a half pounds of honey and put that into it. And what basically I've done there is I've made at least 51% of these soluble sugars from, or in that beer, made them like, be honey, which makes this into a braggot. So it's a blueberry braggot. I just finished it. Um, actually, just when I say finished, I put the priming sugar in, bottled it all today. I still have to do labels and things, but um, that's been one thing I was working on. That's not on video. Uh, I've done. I have a bunch of. Um, I've been doing some Amoretti videos with some various flavors because I have some of those to try. Um, I've also got some other things happening. Basically, there's a bunch of content coming out and if you're wondering where a specific mead is it's probably in the works i just am trying to finalize a lot of those videos so if you're interested in that um but that kind of takes me to this this topic of um testing things that i want to discuss with you guys there's no amount of me testing specific mead concepts or yeasts or anything like that that will truly give you the um, full experience of what I'm doing because half of this battle that we face is tasting your specific mead. If you're tasting, if you're not tasting these things and you're just hearing me say it tastes earthy, it's got, um, it's got floral notes, it's got blah, blah, blah. Like, yes, you're gathering information in that way, but you're not actually developing your palate. Your palate is probably the most valuable thing you can have as a mead maker because that allows you to assess your mead and it allows you to figure out what you need to do to make it better or um, you know just in general what needs to change for that next time so I believe we're in a constant cycle of adapting and reusing recipes doing things um, that are uh, you know going to hopefully get better over time but you have to try these things on your own. So when I try a test, like let's say I did a primary versus secondary apples um, test, you should try that yourself too. It's not a hard test at all. You don't even have to use a full gallon of mead. You could use a half gallon on each side, do your test, and do the same thing that I've done. But basically you'll come to find out what the real result is. So as you're mead making at home, make sure you're actually uh, doing these things for yourself too. Don't just rely on me to give you all the experience because, quite honestly, I can't give you all the information. And maybe my palate tastes different than yours. You might have a different opinion that pineapples actually have a less sweet taste in the primary than they do the secondary. Stuff like that. But that's up to you guys to spend some time. So that's, that's part of my encouragement for this, especially with this weird time where we are stuck in our houses um, the good news is there are still companies shipping honey. You can still buy honey at Sam's and Walmart and Costco, and if you are if you have those available at least. Um, so go out, buy some honey, and make some mead, even if it's just a one gallon thing of mead. This is the perfect time because you have to let it age anyways. Um, so yeah, I enjoy that. But of course, I will continue to do these tests. That's not me saying that I will not do these tests. It's just saying to get a further experience what's happening here, try to make it on your own too, or try my tests as well on your own. So that's kind of an interesting thing. 
A couple other things happening in my brew house. Uh, I have not done any videos on it because I'm currently um, <laughs> overloaded with videos that I'm currently making. Uh, I am competing in the Iron Bee, which is the Mead House competition. And uh, there is, for the competition this year, they have a secret ingredient, which I'm not going to say because this is coming out before the Iron Bee. Um, they have a secret ingredient competition, which I have been playing with that mead some and doing some things with that, and I'm excited about that. The other side of it is uh, there is a, a Braggot Shootout competition, which is what I will be taking my Blueberry uh, Braggot to. And that's why I bottled it to give it hopefully four weeks to carbonate and take care of itself and then use it for this competition. But uh, I definitely think it'll be interesting to, to try that. And uh, I'll be taking that there. The secret ingredient is exciting too. I will share it with that share that with you in the future. I don't have any video of it. Um, last year when I did the Iron Bee, I did my mead literally from the beginning of it all the way until it went to judging. And that video took six months to make. Um, and it was a cool video, no doubt, but it took a long time. It's a long video. It's like an hour long. So if you're interested, go check it out. It's my meat, my first mead competition. Um, that one was interesting. I used, uh, it, the secret ingredient from last year was fenugreek seeds, which if you know anything about them, I didn't know anything about them. You get a very, uh, maple syrupy, caramely taste from them naturally. So people use them quite often to get that maple syrupy taste in a mead. So if you wanted to get that, you can use fenugreek seeds. Uh, some people there had like toasted them in a pan and then put them in, got some really interesting flavors that way. I went the route of the fenugreek, like a fenugreek tea. And then I of course put honey in to make it a mead. And then I added um, pears because I've wanted to do something more with pears recently or had at the time. And so I did pear and cilantro. So that was a very interesting mead. I don't know what prompted me to think of cilantro, but it's very light, a very light taste. And uh, that mead is now almost a year old. So I would love to at some point open a bottle and see how it's aged. But a fenugreek pear cilantro mead. Um, it's really interesting. And I, I will probably do a review of that at some point. I just haven't done one in a bit because I want to let it age. So I also have a video idea for that. Um, I've got lots of video ideas and I'm not going to spoil them here because uh, I want to kind of keep them myself until I can actually do them. Cause if some of them don't work out, then it's real sad. Um, yeah. The other things I'm working on, I have, I need to buy more honey. That's part of my goal for this week. Um, I've also been, Working on a peppermint mead. I actually used pep actual peppermints in this mead that I made recently. Not recently. It's been a while now. Um, I've got some... Yeah, I'm not going to spoil anymore because I think uh, I'll give away what's happening. But I'm excited to continue to brew. I'm making more beers too. I think beer is really nice and it's easy to make. Um, it takes a little longer in the actual creation of the beer because you have to boil things for certain times and then yada yada but i'm enjoying getting to do that some so if you are uh if you are inspired to make or want me to make a specific mead um let me know i would love to put it on my list i do have a running list of things to make my biggest issue right now is literally storage space. Um, while I do have quite a bit of storage space, more than most people, and I'm very thankful for that, um, I'm running out. Like my storage up above me, if you're watching on YouTube, I have like 20 boxes above me here of like 24, you know, can hold 24 bottles each. I've got like 20 of those. I've got stuff in my closets. I've got stuff underneath my bed. Um, I put back two of every single mead that I've made so far for long-term storage so that, you know, two or three years down the line, I can pull those out and see what those taste like. But those are all shoved underneath my bed. I'm running out of storage space, even carboy space. So it's not that I don't want to make these recipes that you guys recommend to me. It's that my list is big and um, I just don't have the space to do it. It's a little bit tough, but it's working out. So I'm definitely inspired by what you guys suggest to me and um, I don't want to diminish that I want to make sure you guys know I appreciate how much you guys have 
the input you put into this uh, channel as well. It's very helpful. Um, yeah, I, I know this episode so far has not been a lot about a specific topic, more about an updates. Um, I hope you all are doing well in you know, you're not too bored in your mead making or in your, um, you know, quarantine life. Uh, I have not been too bored because after I've got mead making, I've got music stuff that I do. Um, you know, I still, I, I still have jobs I have to finish and things like that. I'm keeping myself occupied and hopefully you are too. If not, go make some mead, um, or go make some beer or wine or something, get some experience while you can. I also hope that uh, your family is doing well. Um, I know that times are tough financially, so uh, I, this is just a weird season of life for all of us. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm highly encouraged by what you guys are sharing with me, and I hope that you guys are gaining some education from this, uh, from my channel, and that you are also you know, trying to experiment with your own things. So that was kind of my update with mead making in this time the past couple weeks and going forward i don't know what it looks like exactly i'm still making videos actively and doing all those things but uh we'll see now let's talk about some mead mistakes slash mead successes um, that i've had recently i have been again brewing just a ton of stuff and i want to first start with my like mead successes one thing that I'm excited about, um, I just recently made another big batch of my tropical, um, like heat mead is what I call it. It's basically a pineapple and habanero mead, and it is a traditional mead that I made. I used mesquite honey, made about three gallons of that. Then there's this company called Pot Liquor. Oh gosh, what they're called? Pot Liquor something. Um, Yes, uh, pot liquor kitchen. This is I'm holding it. You can't see it on, uh, obviously through podcast. But this is a pineapple habanero pepper jam, specifically made for. Of course, you can use it in in cooking, but specifically made for brewing. So what I did with this is this is uh, nine ounces. I put all nine ounces into three gallons of a mead, and then let that sit for a little while and then pulled it off. I added some honey and I believe that means really good because it tastes, it's got this weird, interesting kind of heat to it, but it's still, it's not so in your face that like it hurts. You can drink enough of it to be, or you could drink more of it. You don't have to just have a small little sampler of it. So I really enjoyed that. That's kind of been a big success thing for me. Um, I definitely, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed doing that. My mead failure as of recently, these always kind of have something to do with um, making a mess. And my mess that I made recently was I was, I have this stirring rod for, you know, stirring up honey and whatever else I need. And I have a drill and uh, I was mixing some must for a big mead I've, I made and I ended up shooting honey everywhere, just all over the floor and it was a huge mess. And so I, um, I, I didn't meet <laughs> what happened was I was, I was stirring, I pulled the, the stirring rod up. And as I was doing that, I hit the trigger again to activate the drill. And it was just on the top of the mead and it just literally slung mead all over the room. I had to go through and clean up things. Even my like white, um, a cabinet here I had to go through and wipe it down and and touch up a couple spots with paint because I just slung mead everywhere so if you are using something like a stirring rod of, of sorts make sure you are being careful with it and not kind of pulling what I did which is this you know make a big mess moment that's that was my mistake sometimes I make huge mistakes sometimes I make little tiny things but I do want to share with you guys both success and failure within mead making I think it's important that we all see that as well so, kind of a short episode for this week. Uh, I, I really do hope you guys are doing well, and I love getting to talk with you. So, if you are, um, you know, if you're even listening this on Spotify or Apple Podcast, send me an email. Um, send me, get on the Facebook, get on our, our Facebook group, which is, there's the main Facebook for Man Made Mead, which is Man Made Meadery. 
you can find us there. Then there's a subgroup of that called Man-Made Mead Makers. And that is the group where we get to discuss mead making more. It's way easier for you to post your questions because um, generally the way that Facebook works, that page, it's hard to post public questions. But you can on this group public po- ugh, post your public questions um, there very simply. So get on there, check that out if you want to ask me questions. Um, you can send me a, a message through Facebook, through Instagram, those things. I love to get to chat with you guys. Uh, it's this is one of my passions. is It's not just mean making. You know, I like mean mean making. It is getting to talk to you guys and hopefully getting to help answer questions. Um, even hear about your own success, your own failures, uh, because that, that's important too. So. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, check out any links if you want to support the channel. Um, I do I do appreciate even likes and subscribes and subscribing and then um, anything else. You can check out my website. All of that stuff goes to support the channel. And I need your help. Just to be real with you. I need support because uh, this, is, this is something that's not fun to do alone. And I want to do it with you guys. So thank you guys for... Um, for almost, let's see, where are we at? Two and a half years now of con of you know supporting me, and uh, I'll have more content for you in the future. But um, I just appreciate y'all. I hope you will continue to stay safe, stay inside, make some mead um, during this quarantine time, and let's you know let's learn from each other, and hopefully make better mead every single day. So with that. Uh, I will see you guys in episode eight in about two weeks. And yeah, cheers. Cheers.